Today, uh, I'm going to speak about lifelong learning as a concept from the perspective of UNESCO, as I represent the institute uh, here at the conference. Uh, and I will reflect a little bit on the past uh, or historical evolution of the concept of lifelong learning within UNESCO and uh, outside UNESCO, but also uh, together with you, think about the present concept, how this concept is being used at the global education policy, at the national levels as well, but also at the local level. Together, I would like also to think together with you about the future of lifelong learning, particularly in the context of uh, advanced technologies, which are being uh, increasingly used in education and learning organizations as well. So before I start my uh, uh, presentation, I would like to pose a question to all of you. And this question is about your own definition of lifelong learning. I'd like you to take a few seconds to think about this concept because the theme of this conference is about celebrating lifelong learning. How do you define lifelong learning? Okay. Although I'm a teacher, I would have loved to ask some of the definitions, but I'll pass. Um, so, if you want to go back to the historical evolution of the concept of lifelong learning, I'm not going to take you to ancient civilizations in China, India, Greece, but I'll start from a very recent one, from 1970s, from UNESCO's perspective. So at UNESCO, one of the foundational texts which we actually refer to and seminal work in the field of lifelong learning is the publication by the International Commission on Education, which was commissioned by the UNESCO and uh, chaired by Faure, and it's known as a Faure Report in 1972. And the title of it is Learning to Be, the World of Education Today and Tomorrow. The publication is one of the key texts in which lifelong learning was mentioned, but in a different kind of conceptualization. It was mostly referred to as lifelong education. Together with lifelong education, the report highlights the importance of developing learning societies and learning throughout life was supposed to actually uh, contribute to all the societies becoming learning and the, the context in which everyone, irrespective of their age, social status, location, whether it is rural or urban, and many other factors related to, to social factors as well as individual, should not really limit their opportunity to learn. In other words, learning should not be constrained to the walls of schools, which, is, which was oftentimes the case in the 1970s, but it should go beyond the classrooms, beyond the buildings where the learning was supposed to be happening. Because learning was already happening in many places, not just in schools. The text also refers to the shift from the concept of education, which was more about provision, the role and responsibility of the government to provide education, to the concept of learning, which was more about the process, which allows the learner to make decision, as well as to, we have to have uh, credit, give credit to the learner in their own ability to choose educational material, to choose learning pedagogies, as well as learning uh, materials, so that they can develop their capacity, individual capabilities, to learn throughout life, but also to act, uh, to make social changes. Emphasis in, in this text from the lifelong education and the learning society perspective was on human freedom and capacity to act. So it was more about giving, uh, removing authoritarian teaching and pedagogies and enabling more individuals' ability to learn themselves by the help of teachers as facilitators. 
And uh, the text, entire report was also formulated in the tradition of humanism. And all of these uh, issues which I have uh, uh, highlighted in, the, in this uh, report were responses to the issues that were having during that time at the global level, national as well as local levels. And few things I would like to highlight here is that during this time, 1960s and 1970s, there were rise in the student movements, social movements, uh, request, I mean, uh, demanding education to be free of charge, accessible, as well as move away from authoritarian teaching to making it more uh, active learning process. We also know that during this period, majority of the former col uh, colonized nations became independent as well. So there was a lot of emphasis on providing education as one of the main means for development and in independence of these nations. We also know that during this time, there was a lot of confrontations because of Cold War. There were a lot of wars and conflicts, and the, old, the entire world was coming out of the Second World War and trying to build as the sense of humanism and multilateralism as well. The second text, we come to 1990s. Same, UNESCO's International Commission on Education, this time chaired by Fore, oh, sorry, Delors, and is known as Delors Report. 1996, it was published. And this text also refers mainly to the text of Fore. However, the difference between uh, Fore's report and Delors report on conceptualizing learning was about learning throughout life, but with a focus on four pillars of learning. They are known as learning to be, learning to know, learning to do, and learning to live together. Learning to be was to actually supposed to be developing one's personality, to be able to act, with growing autonomy, judgment, as well as taking personal responsibilities. Learning to know was about more uh, understand, developing understanding, knowledge, with the opportunity to work in depth on a small number of subjects. Learning to do was more about not just occupational skills development, but also developing competence to deal with many situations and be able to work in small teams or in, or in different teams. Learning to live together was more about developing an understanding about others and how to live in a society which was becoming more globalized during this period of time. I would like to pose another question, My, but this time I would like to pose this question so that you can chit chat a little bit with one another. Why is lifelong learning important now? If 1970s, 1990s, there was a focus on learning throughout life for many other reasons, at the global level as well as national and local, why is it important now? I'd like you to think few, uh, for a few seconds. Maybe turn to the right and share your thoughts maybe one factor in, uh, or two factors, why lifelong learning should be emphasized now? Uh, I, th I think that it's to want to give knowledge a life, because if it's in books but nobody knows it without reading the book, the knowledge is not alive. And also by keeping it alive, we can acquire more knowledge. Okay, okay, I mean, uh, next slide, thank you. All right, we'll have a lot of time to discuss during coffee break as well. But uh, let's
Let's hear some, uh, some uh, responses. Why do we have to learn or why do we have to emphasize about lifelong learning today and in the future? Yes? Okay, very good, yeah. Thank you, yes? Knowing how things work is power. All right, yes, thank you. Yes, please. Okay, yes, adapting, yes, Lauren? I think especially, you know, those of us in privileged countries, we have to understand that what we know is not all there is to know, and we have to be able to look beyond that and have empathy and understand and learn from every one of us in the rest of the world. Okay, very interesting. Thank you so much for some of the points. Uh, let's see. There are very few global challenges that we face today as global society. We have number one problem as climate crisis, climate change. You know, we are talking about adaptability to kind of technological development, yes, but what about climate change? So lifelong learning is not just for adapting for the technological change, change in the labor market, change in the, let's say, our society in terms of citizenship, migration, etc. But it's about also learning how we are going to survive and how we are going to do as humanity and whether we are able to save our planet from destruction. So it's not just about economic or social issues. It's about our existential crisis almost, no? Of course, we talked about demographic change. In some parts of the world, we have very interesting bifurcation at the moment. We have, in some regions, we have population growth and fast. We have very young populations in some parts of the world who have no access to education. Forget about lifelong learning, but they don't even have access to basic education. We are talking about basic reading and writing skills, literacy and numeracy. We also have, in another part of the world, aging societies, where the number of older generation is increasing, very few young people. So we have to think about how to operate in those kind of situations. and the rest of us. Rise of populism, nationalism, and it actually poses threat to democracy, threat to social cohesion in our societies, but also threat to citizenship principles globally. It decreases the role of importance of multilateralism. Because we don't exist in our silos, in our local community, neighborhood, city, or nation state. We are more than globalized now. I mean, look at around us. We have all, our, I mean, people from 55 countries representing today at this conference, speaking different languages. We also have, um, of course, you know better than I do here yeah, about rapid development uh, in uh, advanced technologies and implication of these on education or for education. What are we going to do with that? Lifelong learning should also respond to such questions. Transformations in the world of work, not just because of technological advancements in workplaces, but it's also about aging society, as I spoke about. So we fast forward from 1996 to the current situation where we are facing enormous number of global challenges to the 
context of SDGs, Sustainable Development Goals, 17 of them. And I would like to highlight that lifelong learning can respond and should be responding to all 17 of them. However, explicitly, clearly, it is mentioned in the uh, SDG 4, which states, ensure inclusive, equitable quality education, promote lifelong learning opportunities for all. The difference between this SDG goal from the previous education for all goal is that EFA focus a lot more on universal basic education, whereas SDG number four on education focuses, includes also lifelong learning for all. So how do we define what lifelong learning is? To understand, but also to decide what kind of commitments member states of UNESCO have to make, we had ancient declaration, which is actually called Education 2030, Framework for Action. In that, the commitments, or the, the goal of number four was elaborated further with many targets, indicators, that will be hel uh, helping us to monitor the progress, whether we are going to achieve this goal or not in the next 15 years. And just now as we are speaking, there is a United Nations General Assembly discussing SDGs. Where are we? Reflecting on their progress on these SDGs, all 17 of them, including education. Sad story is that we are no, not near reaching the SDG goal number four, including other goals as well. However, let's come back to the definition of lifelong learning. In this framework for action document, lifelong learning has been defined as integration of learning and living. So it is about life, and it's about life-wide, and it's about throughout one's uh, journey in this world. So it covers learning activities for all age groups, including children, young people, adults, elderly, girls and boys, women and men, and etc. In all wide contexts, life-wide contexts, not just schools, not just universities, not just vocational technical colleges, but in families, in communities, in workplaces, libraries, museums, health centers, and many other places where our communities gather together or individuals experience their life in. It also can happen through a variety of modalities. The emphasis here is about formal education training, but also capturing non-formal education training and informal learning, which is a little bit different from the previous uh, education goal of the Millennium um, Development Goals. Together, all of it will, should be meeting a wide range of learning needs and demands, and they're responding a wide range of purposes and challenges. Before I go to the next one, I just want to clarify, maybe these three concepts may be new or you have, you know, but we have uh, ISCAD definitions here, which is International Classification on Education, uh, the terminology is, uh, as well, formal education and non-formal education and formal learning. The distinction between them are here. Formal education and training oftentimes institutionalized, intentional, there's a planning happening, usually offered by public organizations, but also recognized private sector. It has to be recognized formally, accredited as qualifications, and there is a continuous educational pathway from early childhood until higher education. Non-formal education can be institutionalized, can be intentional. However, oftentimes, they're considered to be alternative and complementary to formal education. And many of us may be thinking about how technologies are actually revolutionizing learning 
and the non-formal education, informal learning may be more accessible now than it was previously. It's actually not any more complementary in, in the context of COVID-19, they became the main modalities of learning because formal educational institutions closed down during the lockdowns. So not necessarily continuous, non-formal education can be very short term, one week, one day, few week, uh, month. Qualifications are usually not recognized, but currently UNESCO is also working on developing different kind of tools, mechanism for recognition, validation, accreditation of such learning. And um, you may know this la language, I mean, vocabulary like continuing education, mass education, lifelong learning, alternative non-formal education. So they, all of them can be used as synonymously as well. Informal learning is one of the areas which is actually very interesting. However, very little is known. And this is because it is not intentional, not deliberate. It can happen unknowingly, unconsciously. Someone may be actually acquiring such a knowledge. And learning occurring in family, workplace, community, for many other, on many other topics, for many other reasons, can be also called informal learning. It's usually self-directed, family-directed, socially directed. I want to go back to the Education 2030 framework here. Now, what we can pull out from that document, which is the commitment of member states towards achieving SDG goal on education, states five core messages. First is all people, especially those in vulnerable situations, should have access to learning opportunities throughout life. Because we often see this is not happening. Oftentimes, they're limited to basic education. In some cases, they don't even have that access. Particularly women, indigenous women, living in rural areas, remote areas, and they're speaking a minority language. Lifelong learning must be embedded in the education system and requires cross-sectoral collaboration and strong partnerships. So education is no longer just the responsibility of Minister of Education, but many other line ministries. Because lifelong learning is about life-wide learning, about learning different topics and themes and questions. Multiple and flexible learning pathways and entry, re-entry points must be provided at all ages and all educational levels. You know, we know all of us that we went through kindergarten, school, university, and there were specific age requirements. So education SDG 4 highlights the importance of multiple and flexible learning pathways for all kinds of learners, giving opportunity for them. The importance also has been made in terms of a linking between formal education, non-formal education, and it wasn't uh, included here, informal learning as well, so that outcomes of such learning can be recognized through tools and mechanisms developed as well. Learning spaces and environments must be widely made available and the great potential of educational technologies should be harnessed. I will come back a little bit later to this component, the last one, as there are already new developments since it was adopted a long time ago in terms of technology and education. Very recently, we published another International Commission on Futures of Education this time, which wasn't about just for today, but future-oriented one. It's called Reimagining Our Futures Together, a new social contract for education. Now, this international uh, report actually highlights about two things. That the education, in order to become social, uh, social transformatory, socially transformative, it needs to equip the learners with all kinds of capabilities, and we need to learn for greater social good, not just for individual empowerment, freedom, 
or action or benefit, employment, but about greater social good that support, uh, that contributes our, to, to our society to become better, inclusive, equitable, and sustainable. And so learning throughout life was an, an important aspect to it. One distinction between the, the previous two reports and this one is about the shift or suggestion to shift towards from right to education, which actually was more about right to basic edu formal education, to, to the right to learning throughout life. Currently, there are discussions at different regional levels demanding the right to lifelong learning, not just basic education and training. In this context, our institute, Institute for Lifelong Learning, has developed another piece of document in which we highlight about a vision of lifelong learning for the for future. And we, we got this uh, 2050 as a date, which is actually goes beyond the SDG timeline. And the, the report was published as a result of discussions from different um, disciplinary researchers as well as scholars. And uh, I highlighted nine important, I think it was 10, 10 important uh, messages. Number one is we need to recognize the holistic char character of lifelong learning. It's not just lifelong learning as I highlighted that for employment, uh, individual empowerment, and uh, health benefits for the individual and neighbor or family, but it's more about learning to, to live together. It's about uh, taking action towards uh, I would say the impacts of climate crisis and many other issues and be active as citizens of a democratic society. Promote disciplinary, in, transdisciplinary research and intersectoral collaboration for life learning. One of the issues which we continue having is that Oftentimes, when you talk about lifelong learning, it becomes very much the issue of education. However, it is not. It has to actually capture researchers' attention from different disciplines to make it viable option for improving our society at the global level, at the national level as well. We also need to highlight, the reports highlight, uh, states, the importance of putting vulnerable groups at the core of lifelong learning. Currently, majority of the lifelong learning policies in, around the world emphasize for everyone. But when you actually emphasize everyone in your policy, priority will be given everywhere uh, on anyone. The financing, financial means are limited. So where do you place? The critical part of placing vulnerable groups at the core of lifelong learning policies is that you will have more equitable educational and lifelong learning opportunities. And many other things, I think you can uh, just uh, look at it, repeats, uh, to be honest, the previous reports, but with the focus on lifelong learning as a viable option for creating a new social contract for education and learning so that we can develop better sustainable uh, future of our societies. So I spoke a lot about utopian vision. UNESCO has been actually criticized a lot about this is, I mean, it's a good idea, but it's not very pragmatic. It's difficult to take actions. It will be difficult to actually get these visionary ideas and put it into policy documents. How do we do it? So our institute has been contributing to the uh, interpretation of the visionary goals of education from UNESCO's interna uh, International Commissions on Education Report to make it as a reality through policy, practice, and initiatives at the global, local, as well as national levels. 
couple of things I would like to highlight here is that we do so by developing guidelines for policymakers. How to put the concept of lifelong learning from those visionary contexts a reality for a local as well as national levels. We do so by developing also capacity building trainings for policymakers and stakeholders, civil society, at the national and local level as well. We do so by working on research, teaming up with research scores from around the world and publishing different kinds of thought pieces, but also case studies, exemplary initiatives, so that member states and other stakeholders can learn from each other. And very recently, we also, during COVID time, COVID was very good, I think, in terms of help uh, making us think out of box. We developed our own multi-modal uh, um, uh, platform, online platform, using Moodle. And um, I mean, we are hosting on Moodle platform, and Lauren has been helping quite a bit as well on that. And we started engaging uh, policymakers on an online platform, learning about lifelong learning, developing their capacities. Of course, we are also adding hybrid versions because we know that there should be a lot of discussions and learning cannot be done just on online. And in many parts of the world, uh, I mean, access to technology is still a problem. We work with 193 uh, countries around the world. So we develop such uh, uh, online opportunities and uh, team up with other national level uh, agencies to strengthen capacities at the national and local levels. In some of the publication you can see here, our Learning Hub capacity building platform is very young. It's, uh, we have launched it in 2021. And actually, the official launch was this year, May. And uh, we are planning to organize more such or, or online learning for policymakers, researchers, as well as practitioners and providers and to make it available in multiple languages. And I'd like to make a plea here. We actually have very uh, limited capacity as, as a team. We have five people only in my entire team. And we always look for capacity uh, in terms of developers, but also instructional learning designers in other languages. Arabic, Spanish, French, Chinese, Russian, and many other national languages as well. Because we see increasingly, we don't have such capacity. We look for, for such uh, uh, consultants and uh, experts in the field to help us design our trainings so that it is accessible to our member states as well. Very quickly, I want to highlight one more uh, example uh, from our institute where we are trying to make a, a lifelong learning as a reality at the very local level. Our institute hosts, or we are the secretariat of the global network of learning cities. We have three, more than 300 cities from around the world. And in which we are trying to understand but also support capacities at the local level, at the municipal level on how a city can become a learning city. What are the things actually characterizes, uh, characterize uh, cities as learning cities? You remember we talked about learning society. From that concept, we are trying to see learning neighborhoods, learning cities, learning villages, etc. But this model it has been successfully uh, implemented for 10 years. We'll be celebrating 10 years here uh, this year. And these are the building blocks for a learning city. I think if you can um, uh, use the QR code, you'll get more information about that. In which these 300 learning cities actually are supported by creating their own clusters on different themes and they learn from each other. So our institute's role really to create this platform for them for knowledge exchange in terms of policy as well as practice. And learning cities also celebrate learning festivals where different kind of initiatives at the very local level, very small scale or large scale are being presented as well. 
Some of these initiatives use technologies in education quite uh, successfully as well. I would like to highlight another matter here, educators. In the current context, educators' role has been changing also. They are shifting. It has already been conceptualized in 1970s uh, in the foreign report as uh, teachers to be more facilitators of learning rather than uh, the ones who have all the knowledge with themselves. Technology made knowledge or information available now. Teacher is no longer a textbook, textbook, very single textbook in some parts of the world, is no longer the authority of knowledge. So, however, we also know educators play a fundamental role in promoting tolerance, encouraging dialogue, improving gender equality, advancing different kinds of cultural and social values, but also contribute largely in the preparation or build, uh, creating uh, the next generation for our sustainable future. But one of the things which we have identified at the Institute is that oftentimes when you talk about the educators at the global level, there is a lot of emphasis on formal school teachers. But lifelong learning is about all sectors, for all ages. We have to include educators who are working in the early childhood, as well as TVET, higher education, but more importantly, those who work in the communities, within NGOs, civil society organizations as well. Although we have been talking about educators being, having low digital skills, lower than they are students, oftentimes, we also know many of the educators given opportunity and provided uh, uh, training, relevant trainings, they been, can become active creators of educational online content and the different kind of learning resources because they know practice well. They know their learners. They have experience to rely on. I think very critical examples emerged during COVID-19. When, when many teachers started developing their own content across the world, sharing with each other, using Zoom or lesson study groups, really learning on the job. But as we highlight in the, uh, uh, one of the uh, publications we had this year, uh, last year, Technology in Education Report, in which we have to think technology is not going to should not replace teachers. It should be complementary. It should be about helping teachers and learners in the process of learning and teaching, but not replacing them. I think many countries also, oftentimes, in order to save money, in order to come up with different kinds of strategies, they may deploy, they, or in some parts of the world, they start deploying already technolo technological tools to kind of compensate or to address the issue of teacher shortages. We have, we have a lot of, I mean, there's an increased shortage for trained teachers all around the world. I mean, the Hamburg, where, where I'm coming from, they have shortage of teachers as well because the population of students are increasing because of the migration, but the teachers are aging as well. They're retiring. So we have these kind of uh, issues. And oftentimes, maybe, the quick solution policymakers may come up with using technologies for that. However, again, technology cannot, cannot replace human touch, human interaction. In terms of, I didn't want to talk about uh, policies around uh, technologies in education, but a few things I want to highlight. Sorry, yes, I saw one minute. Yeah. Um, uh, here, UNESCO is currently working very uh, hard and very also fast, I think, on uh, developing policies and frameworks on uh, technologies that are being used in education field. This includes uh, generative AI as well. Uh, in, we had very recently, at the beginning of September, Digital Learning Week, 
in which the, there was a lot of discussion around human-centered, learner-centered design of technologies, the importance of technologies being used as a complementary, as a support, but not replacement of teachers and other uh, teaching staff and personnel. And uh, in many, the studies of uh, UNESCO has shown also many countries, many ministers of education, parents, learners themselves, are not protected from the, some of the abuses of technology as well. Here, UNESCO's role is really supporting member states and all the stakeholders to make sure that all the technological developments in education are ethical. So by creating ethics in the application of these technologies, including especially in generative AI, has been highlighted in these policy documents as well. It is not to say that we should shy away, block use of technologies in education, but use it ethically and use it with evidence, study, evaluate the impact before we start scaling and before we start uh, promoting it as a product to be used in our educational processes. I think I will uh, sum up now very quickly if it's a few highlights. I think um, one important thing is that we need to adopt the concept of lifelong learning in its entirety, as I highlighted already from the beginning. And we have to also not forget that you have seen 1972, 1996, 2020, uh, 2021, we are still seeing the evolvement, evolution of this concept of lifelong learning. We need to keep thinking around that. What it is to be a lifelong learner in today's time, tomorrow, and in the, in the next 10 years. We need to recognize the value of uh, lifelong learning as a public good. Oftentimes, learning is considered private. However, we need to understand that learning, education, should remain as public good. It should be accessible, affordable. It should be, even if possible, free. And it has to respond to a variety of challenges, not just employment, which is oftentimes investment in education is seen as from the perspective of human capital theory only. Employment, training for work, uh, workforce for the uh, market needs. It has to be about environmental sustainability. It has to respond to citizenship issues and challenges in our countries. It has to be about inclusion as well. It has to strengthen our capacity to learn, but act for so greater social good. And as I highlighted again, I don't want to repeat again here, one of the important things is that learning is about human interaction. Self-directed learning is good, but it has to add social learning aspect as well. Because our knowledge, our learning experiences enrich, is enriched by our interaction with the others. And I would like to thank all of you for your attention and thank you so much for this invitation. Thank you, Rahat. That was incredibly inspiring and awesome, I think, for all of us to think about how individually and collectively we can contribute to a model of like flow learning across our countries. So, yeah, really awesome presentation. Everybody, we now have some time for questions. Um, we have some roving microphones, so please um, perhaps put your hands up if you have a question you'd like to ask, and we'll send the microphone over to you. Thank you. Um, hello. First of all, thank you so much for that presentation. Um, I just had one question. You mentioned that we are not close to SDG goal number four, which is about ensuring inclusive and qu equitable quality education. I want to understand that, is there a particular reason why we are not close to that goal? And if so, then what can we do to get nearer to that goal? Okay, do I take the questions one by one? Yes. Okay. Thank you so much for this question. Um, yeah, unfortunately we are not, we are off track. 
because if you look at the indicators, uh, when these uh, goals were defined, these are very generic goals. And the SDG 4 has, uh, if, I don't, if I'm not mistaken, four global indicators. Four global indicators include learning outcome base, for example, all children having proficiency, basic proficiency, the level is also defined already at the global level, at particular level, have to have numeracy, reading skills, etc. And you know very well that we have children who are out of school still. COVID-19 has impacted seriously on the learning of children in all the countries as well. We also have increased conflicts, disasters, we just know, uh, uh, I think two weeks ago, we had disasters and earthquake in uh, Morocco, in Libya. We have continued conflict in Afghanistan, Syria, and many other countries. That's why we are off track on all the indicators of uh, education, for example. What we can do? All of us as individuals, we are already contributing to some extent, making sure that learning is happening whether it is through non-formal, informal. I think I would encourage you to cont continue doing that. Of course, indicators are were very ambitiously set, let me put it this way. And financial resources oftentimes were not also given, provided, or was not, were not planned through. And these contribute also over ambitious, uh, I mean our inability to achieve ambitious goals that we have set, aside, uh, set uh, forward for us. But of course, I think what else can we do? I, mean, I will be happy to hear more ideas. Technology can, uh, as I said, can complement how to improve learning of children, adults as well. For example, one of the indicator of SDG 4, global indicator, is on the functional literacy and numeracy. All youth, 100%, and a substantial percent uh, proportion of adults. I mean, the, the substantial proportion can be set uh, by the national, national uh, member states themselves. For example, it's about uh, developing different kind of tools, supporting teachers, educators of adult educators in the field, in the development of pedagogies, using online, offline, contributing voluntarily to some of the developments, for example, or creating some social, uh, social relevant projects. I think the, I, uh, these are the actions, but most important one, as citizens of your countries, you need to also raise this issue of investing in education as public good. We see in many parts of the world, because of these ambitious goals, I'm not, I'm not suggesting it's bad, there is an increased reliance of the governments on the private sector which you know that it creates a lot of issues in terms of equality because the private sector oftentimes is not free and not affordable. Yeah, we have increased inequality in learning outcomes between poor and rich. I, I hope I responded to, uh, to your question. Very well. Thank you. Other questions? Yes, here. Hello, uh, I'm Steve from Inclusive Education. We're a joint venture with Save the Children, um, the INGO. Um, thank you for the QR codes. Uh, that was fantastic. Um, I've got a lot of reading to do. In the GEM report that you gave us a link for, um, the intro says there are often bitter divisions in how the role of technology is viewed. What advice would you have to us as passionate e-learning practitioners? We love technology. We want to be in supportive consulting roles, but often come up against those bitter divisions. What advice would you have for us if we're wanting to work in the sector? Thank you so much. I think uh, I wouldn't have the, the best advice right away because I think we are still thinking about on the role of education, uh, technology on education. I mean, GEM report highlights about this kind of um, very uneasy position uh, in terms of use of technology over reliance or using technology as a silver bullet for the, all the challenges to fix and uh, using, relying on the tools, specific tools to bring changes 
in the challenges that we are facing. I think that's the isolated development of technology without having the general perspective or larger impact. I think that's where the issue lies. In many countries also, we don't have, a, as I stated, really good evidence-based impact studies, evaluations. In some, in some cases, there are evaluations, but they are self-evaluations, where the external review hasn't been done. I think all of this uh, kind of uh, highlights the importance of different kind of stakeholders being involved, not just one uh, sector, for example, private sector leading in the, the development of technologies in education or using it as, a, as an opportunity to sell their products. I think that was, that's what has been highlighting as well. Another issue which uh, GEM report also specifies, I think, is the role of uh, educators themselves in the choice, in the, you know, being more knowledgeable about these tools. And you know very well that majority of the time uh, our educators are lagging behind the development. Education as a sector is lagging behind. We are like in the mode of catching up. We are not leading the discussions. I think that's where the, uh, a lot of issues lie because we are coming up with the frameworks and policies a little bit later when the, such uh, technologies have been already entering our, si our social lives. As um, consultants, as um, practitioners in this field, I think always be vigilant about what kind of consequences this advice or your, the, uh, what is it, um, suggestions, recommendations we are making are having on the lives of children, on the lives of learners, whether adults or youth as well. Yes. Time for one more question. I think Michelle here. Yeah, thank you for that. Uh, I think your comment really resonates. The fact is that in developing countries, things are decreasing the budget in education, and the increasing commodification of education is really excluding a whole lot of children. But I think uh, one of the reasons we are here is that projects like Moodle are a response to the commodification. Uh, of uh, education where uh, if multilateral agencies like UNESCO as well as governments can actually move towards open source, uh, then the cost effectiveness, the scalability and so on. The problem is that most of the governments are still very swayed or under the pressure of typical you know, corporate technologies. So I think as a community of people here, if we really want to move towards SDG4, uh, we really need to push projects, uh, all the open source uh, what is being released in the world, but I mean, at the bottom of the line, bottom line is governments are decreasing in, in their GDPs in education and it's impacting further and further and this is only exacerbating. So lifelong learning looks like a dream, you know, in most developing countries where we don't even have the basics. But uh, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. I think it was huh? uh, I think it was a comment. I think, uh, thank you so much for highlighting these issues about it, about financing education. This is where we have a little bit problematic in terms of terminology change from education to learning. And I have been reading a little bit about criticism against UNESCO's uh, concept of lifelong learning. Was that when we, education oftentimes about provision, state's responsibility to provide basic education free, affordably. Whereas with the shift happened on learning, then the responsibility oftentimes shifted to the learner himself or herself. And then the entire then learning process is commodified. It becomes like uh, the, 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 any other services as well. I think that's where the issue lies. Many governments do not think investing in education is going to bring change very quickly because investment in education yields are uh, what the results uh, only after a generation. So that's why I think um, may, um, most of the time they do not. They are not willing to invest as well. It's better to invest in building roads than investing in the education of young children who are going to become adults after few, several years. No? Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you again, Rahat. We really appreciate you joining Moodle Moot Global. Thank you.